is three after seven and we will get started with the October 10th uh, Hadley Climate Change Committee meeting. Welcome everyone. And the first item of business is approving the minutes. Yeah. So if everybody had a chance to read the minutes and thank you for doing the minutes. Okay. You're welcome. I'm gonna need a motion and a second on the minutes. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes. And I second the approval of the minutes. All right. And a vote. All in favor? All right. Yep. Thanks. So we have two special guests here today. So Megan, um, you'll need to help me with your last name, even, the, yes. even <laughs> though I'm usually pretty good with Polish last names, um, from the, Hampshire, uh, the Hamden Hampshire Conservation District. You're the grant administrator there. Uh, so uh, we welcome you. And we also have Darcy Dumont, who's from Zero Waste Amherst and a few other groups, um, who will be sharing about trash in Amherst. Megan? Great. Yeah. Great. So, Sue Jeanski is how it's said. Oh, <laughs> Sue. My, I have my um, spouse's side of the family is a long line of educators, and so they actually have a visual that they use for that, which is if you can imagine a person named Sue wearing jeans going skiing. So it's there Sue Jeanski. Um, <laughs> I've been grateful for that. <laughs> um, so, so uh, our office, the Hamden Hampshire Conservation District office, is actually right in the NRCS USDA building, right by um, Tandem Bagel. You're maybe more acquainted Gregory's. with. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What's it called? The USDA. It's the big white um, office complex that's got uh, the bakery there in the corner, and, and it's near um, Tandem, Tandem Bagel. Yeah. So we're we're tucked in there, but most of us work remotely and in the field uh, majority of the time. So so is that um, office like open to the public? During the um, day? Not usually. It's a federal office that we're tucked inside of. So um, it's I mean we can we can reserve comp the conference room if people wanted to come in and talk with us. But and I have a I have an agricultural outreach um, coworker who does work with producers in Hamden and Hampshire counties. So he works um, specifically with our regenerative agriculture equipment rental program. We have, um, it's some people call it no-till or low-till equipment. Um, so we have a, a producer outreach side of the house and then we have the public outreach side of the house, which is what I work in. And um, as far as our current grant program that we're running, which is funded through um, the Massachusetts um, uh, Office of, um, oh my gosh, um, it's such an acronym world. What does it stand for? Um, it stands for, it's EEA. Environment and environment. What is it? Energy and environmental affairs. There it is. <laughs> the Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, we have a grant from them that we wrote to be able to work on more sustainable landscape strategies for uh, residents. And so that's the grant program that I'm here to talk to you about tonight. Um, we are focused on native plants in the home landscape because native plants are. Um, pretty heavy lifters as far as above ground impact for pollinators as well as below ground for soil health. And um, I won't uh, get into the minutiae because that's what our workshop series is about. <laughs> so you can join us this winter, uh, January through March, we'll have a series of um, presenters um, talking about various aspects of growing native plants in your landscape um, and how to, how to use them in, in in wonderful ways for both beauty and pollinator support, but also um, as a mitigation of climate change effects. So, um, so we have I have a handout for you, but I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the main features of the program. I'd like to highlight our website because this is where people can access information. We just we're HamdenHampshireConservation.org, and um, if you go into the layers of our, oh, it says no internet. Shoot. Um, mm. If you go into the layers of our, of our, um, I, I'm going to need to fix that. How can I sync up with you? Um, I can show you our native plant program page because it's already here, but I, uh, I will want to play a video, at least part of a video. So excuse me while we do this. It's right here. There you go. Is there a guest? Is it yeah. HSC guest? Yep. Perfect. You know, log on Thank you so much. Here we go. All right. Yes. That was I easy. I I need one of those buttons. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So right on our native plant program. So if you go under the programs and services menu on our main page, um, it'll get you to the native plant program. So that's where I am. 
And <coughs> on here is an interest form that people can complete if they want to request um, access to the program. Uh, right now we're scheduling appointments for spring. And so what I'm talking about is um, for residents of Hamden and New Hampshire counties, our, our idea was not only to provide information for what you could do in your home landscape, but also equip people to do those things in their landscape. And our first step is focused again on native plants. So you can request a free one hour consultation with wow. one of our many native plant experts. We are so blessed to have so many native plant <laughs> experts in our counties that we serve, um, mainly due to the presence of the Commonway School of Landscape Design. Several of them are graduates of that program. And um, they operate their own businesses, namely Tom Sullivan of Pollinators Welcome and Owen Wormser of um, Abound Design. Um, and he's also the author of uh, Lawns into Meadows, um, which is um, a book that we're supplying to our, li our library partners so that those can be in circulation. So you can request a uh, consultation with one of our, we have five active consultants right now. Um, and they come to your place of living. Um, it can be a condo, it can be a house, it can be um, a farm, it can be property that you're not living on but that you happen to own. Um, and they'll consult with you about what kinds of native plants would be well suited to the space that you have. So that's typically along the lines of things like moisture and sun. Um, some people already are ahead of the game and they already have several native plants in place and so they're interested in what other pollinators can I serve? What other species of plants should I bring in to serve more pollinators? And, um, and so they provide the, the client with a list of plants that would work well in that setting and then the client takes that list to um, one of the partner nurseries and we're supporting, we're most closely connected right now with um, Wing and a Prayer and coming to yes. us, and also uh, Checker Spot Farm and Cole Rain. We haven't been able to partner yet with Nasami. I know they're in high demand and they're much closer for a lot of people, but they haven't been able to um, build us into their capacity yet. For What's the other one? Wing and a Prayer and who else? Uh, Checker Spot Farm and Cole Rain. Checker Spot. Yeah, they're they're right up. If you um, if you get off. 91 in Greenfield and take Route 2 and then you turn like you're going um, like you're going to Shelburne this that's that mm -hmm. back road they're they're pretty much it's Jacksonville Road they're right on the road right past the center of Coleraine it's an old dairy farm and they converted it into a native plant uh, nursery you were talking about all the wonderful things that happened in Hadley during the pandemic this yeah. uh, couple bought that farm and really uh, revamped it into a wonderful nursery so um, so uh, those two nurseries are willing to take the list and then, depending on what they have in stock at the time, because it does change throughout the season, from your list, they put together, they assemble a starter set of plants for you to put in your, in your home landscape or in your, in your um, landscape. So uh, that value, it's about a $200 value for the consultations and it's about $150 to $200 value for the plants. Um, and so that comes to about 350 um, that we're providing free to residents Even to get the them started. Are free? Plants are free. Yeah. Wow. My um, goodness. It's just really, we just want to help people get going. So, wow. And then, as How I mentioned, many plants usually? it depends on the nursery. Um, so they have different size containers and um, there are different degrees of maturity of plants. So um, it's between 16 and like 38, depending on. Plants. Depending on the size of the containers that the do, nurseries have at the time, do they uh, do they work with not not for pro nonprofits as well, like organizations or synagogues or churches or our our district? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Um, so the way that we started this program was we started partnering with municipalities to identify um, spaces that they were willing to convert from mowed lawn or non-contributing. Um, spaces, green spaces, uh, into native plant gardens or meadows. And so um, in, in our counties, down here in Hampton and New Hampshire counties, I'm going to have to reload this real quick. We have partnered with um, several so far. Uh, right. Is that our library? In I saw, I, I, I know that Owen Wormser worked with yeah. the library. Public Library right here. Yep. So we're right here in this flower, 
And we have Lily Library, which just uh, installed at the end of September. This is Look Park. We're helping to augment one of their meadows. Um, so that's in development right now. That's why it's yellow. In South Hadley, the Gaylord Public Library put in a demonstration garden. And the Holyoke Senior Center um, put in a demonstration oh, garden. This is just our first year. We just started this, this grant program in the mm. spring. So this is, this is five. For, for one season, and our program runs through next June. It may run beyond that. And with a little bit of a backstory on the Hadley Library, we had about 25 volunteers on a Saturday who went in, tilled the soil, mm -hmm. planted them, and then put in the mulch, and you helped us along the way. Right. So yeah. I'll show you two. Our, our sibling um, district up in Franklin County has these. So. If you look, you can see um, they're kind of spread out across Franklin County this way and this way. But down here we have, we're trying to build out this corridor, this pollinator support corridor, all the way through the um, counties that, that um, flank the Connecticut River. So, um, so mm -hmm. we're doing it in partnership with one another. So there's, okay. there's these. If only the river was more coordinated. Oh, right. well, yeah, rivers don't want to be straight. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> so, so we're right. just tick-tocking across. But if I told you that what was delightful to us was that in this first, so five demonstration gardens, which we're using um, to put in place to demonstrate really the variety and versatility of native plants, of working with native plants, because you can have something much more uh, planned looking, much more um, what people are used to seeing in a landscape, a business landscape, or a more formal kind of um, organized landscape versus meadows. So there's a, it runs the whole spectrum. Right, you can do, can, lots you of can different do things. landscape design with native yeah, plants. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, and you can do turf grass replacement. You, there's ground cover options with native plants if you just want a nice green cover that's low grow. So there's lots of different things you can do with them. So we're trying to demonstrate various applications with native plants to help people understand what's possible in the space. I was space. wondering, do you, besides, I mean, I think perennials when you say pollinators, right. but are you doing anything like with mixed grasses or? Yes, yeah, so, so without getting into the content of our workshops, the grasses are really important both for the architecture and support of other perennial plants, um, but also um, they are, they provide a lot of um, bedding for the, the colder months that helps a lot of those, um, well, they have those baby, nice root structure. Pollinate, yes, the baby pollinators survive through the winter as well as, um, yeah, creating infiltration in the, in the soil for air and water, which is awesome. Is there any plan at our library to expand each year, the, the garden? That well, you I think they're trying to kind of keep it small because sometimes they actually want to use the oh, the front right. yard. Yeah. The lawn that's is right, pretty much it. <laughs> they, they like their yeah. outdoor space. They allowed yeah. us to expand, which was great. Um, yeah. And we replaced um, some of the non-native sterile plants that were there because a lot of a lot of non-native favorite landscape perennials are actually sterile. Yeah. So they don't offer anything to pollinators. Um, and so they were they allowed us to replace some of those and then we actually um, mirrored the developed garden side that as you face the library, it's on the right, um, we installed one on the left to kind of balance it out, yeah. which is really nice. So and, and here's a picture, you know, I I went to one of the workshops at the library and then put in a a, a garden at home. And mm -hmm. so it's very nice, the mix of flowers mm -hmm. and grasses. Mm -hmm. It's pretty incredible. Right. So if you can imagine, in addition to these five demonstration gardens, in our first year in Hamden and New Hampshire counties, we did 69 residential consultations. <laughs> wow, so if you can imagine awesome. 69 additional little dots on there, which are coming this way. This and did, that it, did it also include putting in a little garden? Yeah, that was the plants. Uh, yeah. So oh, they all awesome. got they all got yeah, their sets of plants cool. with the consultations. Went off. Um, um, some people are delaying until spring to put those in because they didn't have you know the time I before know, the ground is going to get cold. Hopefully but they didn't. but so there's those extra spots Marian, which are our webmaster is going to put Ooh. on there over the winter. Yeah. So I do have um, a courtesy of Hadley Public Media or Hadley Media. We have um, <laughs> a video of <laughs> that's what I was going to mention actually that video mm -hmm. that Nick did. Yeah. Oh. So. This is our Jack's perennial garden. This is a little video from our Just project. planted this year. There's a
This is Megan Sujinski with the Hamden Hampshire Conservation District. We are delighted to be partnering on a grant with municipalities in Hamden and Hampshire counties and especially community spaces like Hadley Public Library. This is our first native plant demonstration garden in Hampshire County. Owen Wormser is a local native plant expert, owner of Abound Design and author of Lawns into Meadows and we're thrilled to be working with him on both um, the design and impl implementation for these projects. And the idea is to re-educate the public about the virtues of native plants, um, both for pollinators above ground, providing pollen and nectar sources and beauty, as well as improving soil health through creating um, wonderful channels for water and air. And we are um, not only installing these great gardens with signage to help spread the word, we're also hosting workshop series in the fall and winter so that people can learn more in depth about um, how to work with native plants and the ease of working with native plants as well as what to do in your own landscape and then you are eligible for a one hour free consultation with a native plant expert that's working on our team as well as a free starter set of native plants from one of our local growers. So we're delighted um, to be kicking off uh, the proje project in such a central place in Hampshire County and um, to be beautifying the public library in such a significant way.
So there's just a little cap. Cool. Nice. We did find out that the builder of the library kind of had some of the library cloth that went a little too far. It was real. <laughs> oh, it was yeah, yeah, yeah. Hassle, but it was we, a hard one garden project. We worked through it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, so thank you again for that. That was really beautiful coverage, and it's much longer than just that little clip that I just shared. I think you and, um, did seven. I, yeah. Again, that um, that interest form is available right here. It's linked right on the native plant program page, and I have a little printout that you can take that just summarizes all the things that I've talked about this evening. Um, we are looking, continuing to look for more partners, more demonstration garden partners in um, Hampshire County, and especially in Hamden County, where so far we only have one, but we're looking forward to continue to expand the program and um, do some GIS mapping of our potential impact through the program. Mm -hmm. um, and we have wonderful partners besides these great uh, consultants that we're, we're fortunate to have locally. We have wonderful partners in the area, the Mass Pollinator Network, uh, CESA is doing great things, uh, NOFA Mass is doing wonderful things too, um, actually the Pollinator Network is now under their umbrella. So um, we're, we're glad to have so many people to reach back to us with this because the district operates um, with a very small staff and a volunteer board mm -hmm. and very small grants. So we're just we're just tickled to be able to do this kind of work and oh, it's to make such an impact. So so thanks for having me. I really, I really, really appreciate <laughs> it. It's fun talking like with you about it. I'll pass these around if everybody wants to just take So I, I was at your website and it looks great. like do you have plant sales? Also? We did. Um, so we so long, long ago, before I was part of the district, um, they had an annual like seedling sale, trees and um, bulbs. So um, you know, bulbs from Holland. And um, and when we started these native plant programs, we um, we started uh, offering native plants for sale. So same partners same nursery partners um, and we had that September 7th and it's also just it's an awareness raising campaign. Oh, you it's, just had it. Yeah, we had our Thank second you. one at the library on September 7th, but we, it's online. You purchase online through us, and then we have our distribution day, and we, we always order extra so that if people want more or decide they want to try a different species than what they ordered, um, they can. So we, we'll, as far as I know, we'll do it again next September as well. You don't do it in the spring? We don't, yeah. So the thing about native plants is that they, they wake up a lot later than um, non-natives. So a lot of these greenhouse grow you know um, uh, I just think they're you know they're what people are used to buying and they're they're cultivars most of, for the most part and um, the native you sell you know no no the things that you usually see available in the in the nurseries in the spring are not native plants and um, so native plants are really slow to wake up they don't look great at first so people are not as trusting in their quality or that they'll actually survive if they take them home in the spring but they absolutely absolutely do great they just um, they also appreciate being planted in the fall because okay. the ground gets a lot uh, wetter usually in the fall yeah. and they have some time to establish their roots and so we're, we're that's why the timing they just um, they're a little bit more robust come the end of the season they look more like something you put in your yard. I noticed Hadley Garden Center has started a little section of yeah. native plants mm -hmm. and they even had a woman there from that nursery and they they looked awful mm -hmm. I mean at first they <laughs> yeah. looked good but then after being there a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. they were starting to look really beat up. But I bought a bee balm anyway. Ooh, <laughs> you'll, you won't be you won't be sorry. <laughs> well, it got really a lot of powdery mildew, but I knew it yeah, would. It happened. Monarda is like that. It's like flocks that way. Right, but it still bloomed. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and the bees love it. Yeah, yeah. they don't care about the powdery. No, we no, do. They don't. They don't. <laughs> right, right. Any questions about anything? I'm I'm trying to move quickly because no. I know you have a lot on your agenda. Just to compliment, five mm -hmm. demo gardens and 69 yeah. other gardens. Yeah, that's really impressive. That's yeah. a great. Well, it's just been the public root. response, really. Yeah. I mean, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of work to try to get the word out, and the demo using the libraries is a no-brainer, yeah. right? Because yeah. they're such great community centers. There were people congregate for all kinds of reasons, wonderful meeting spaces, they're, they're community resource centers. So that was yeah. that was savvy on our part. I'll take credit for that. <laughs> so do you, yeah. Is there a way that a person could like register on, on the website to yeah. be on your mailing list? Or? Yeah, so when you go to our main landing page, the, a pop-up comes up and it is a, hey, join our join our information mailing list. Okay. And so I you'll get our I newsletter did, and our um, you'll be on our email oops. list as well. So okay. Um, but again, that the interest form for getting a consultation is one layer in on the native plant page. Yeah. I want to know when those plant sales are. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we usually start it, we try to have it up by um, July 1st, and we run it through the end of August, um, and then we, we distribute in September. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for yeah. coming in. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Our second guest tonight is Darcy Dumas. And Darcy will share work, uh, share her work with Zero Waste Amherst and ways to look at decrease in waste and the cost of trash removal in Amherst. And you know, one one thing that I dug out just to bring in, just to triple check, for half a year um, at my house, we've been paying three hundred and eighty-four dollars for trash removal. So almost $800. Now we have recently changed and we're going with Pioneer Valley Waste um, and they're charging much less, but still um, the cost of trash and the whole issues related to trash is just enormous nowadays. So Darcy, thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, uh, and Jack and I had talked about this, the, the USA prices when we saw each other last weekend uh, at an event. And um, yeah, the difference between Hadley prices and Amherst prices are very different too for mm -hmm. subscription services. So mm -hmm. Hadley pays a lot more than Amherst does mm -hmm. for the same size container. The prices are not on the website for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. But we're way more spread out. Yes. So oh, well, yeah, there. yeah. I guess that could be part of it. Um, so um, I have been working with um, Zero Waste Hammers. Uh, it started about five years ago, and we looked at different issues that might reduce waste in town and um, uh, were, were steered toward the possibility of, of uh, reforming the hauler system. And that was because um, with our current system, we have one hauler that serves about 5,000 residents, or 5,000 households, and, <clears throat> pardon my voice, um, and... That hauler is? is USA. It USA, okay. Um, it's the only hauler that's licensed mm -hmm. for residential, uh, single-family residents hauling in Amherst. And, um... Darcy, want some water? I do have a... Do you want me to get you some water? Sure. Okay. That would be great. Sure. Yeah, no. <laughs> I used to be a yeah. town counselor. Yeah. This happened all the time. Mm. Um, anyway, um, uh, we are... Two years ago, we were able to um, get a, uh, a motion to refer our proposal to one of the council subcommittees the Town Services and Outreach Committee, and we were able to get four um, councilor sponsors, and Zero Waste Amherst was the community sponsor. So we proposed, um, I'm just gonna go through the elements of what we proposed, and then I'll talk about why, why we would wanna do those things. So I'm gonna skip some of these slides. This was the original a uh, slideshow that we used two years ago, and it was put together by one of the counselors, Shalini Balmelon, if anybody knows her. Mm. Um, she was one of, she was a, thank you very much. So, um, let's see, I think this works. Okay, this is the actual motion, but we don't have to look at that. Um, it had six main elements. So, um, one element was that it, it defined compostable materials to be um, food scraps, but not just food scraps, but also co other compostable materials. Because we're a college town, we have an unbelievable amount of uh, takeout containers yeah. from restaurants that could be compostable. So it would also include compostable paper, takeout containers, dirty paper, paper towels, paper plates, um, uh, anything that you might have as a result of an event 
Um, it would take meat and eggs and things that people don't put in their backyard compost. Um, it would also take compostable containers that look like plastic but are yeah. actually cornstarch. Mm -hmm. And so those, we defined it according to what Martin's Farm takes. Right. And I've, those of you who don't know, Martin's Farm is really the only industrial scale compost facility mm -hmm. in the Western Mass area. We have other anaerobic digesters, uh, but we don't have a industrial scale compost facility that takes the crunchy compost. <laughs> and, and Darcy, um, Martin's Farm would have the capacity to take yes. on Amherst? Okay. Yes, we have talked to them and mm -hmm. They have the capacity. Um, and I highly recommend visiting them there. It's quite quite an entertaining tour. And we get their yeah. compost for our projects, so mm -hmm. it's good quality. Yeah. compost is awesome. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we should um, do another field trip. Because <laughs> I don't know. Did you go with us? No, no, I've never been to Martin's. Have you been? Oh, I've gotten compost from them. Okay. So the, the main way that we felt that we would be able to, to reduce our waste as far as comp hauler services was to gain control over what the hauler does. And the way to gain control over what the hauler does is to have a contract with the hauler. What we... What we uh, For the town to have... The town to have a contract with the hauler. What we found through a variety of research was that hauler prices with, with towns with contracts with their haulers um, the residents paid about half mm -hmm. of what they paid when they they contracted individually with the hauler now that doesn't include towns with um, curbside compost pickup that would be added uh, but as far as uh, just straight difference between a uh, town with a competitive bidding process and a contract versus a town without, it was half as much for, for uh, the cost for residents. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the first thing we felt we needed was a contract. And um, the, you know, when we surveyed residents of the town, they, there was a very high level of agreement. <laughs> um, uh, and the two things that we felt that we could control through a I'm compact. sorry to interrupt, but I think everybody should see this. My son-in-law oh. just sent this picture. They live in North Adley. Oh, right now? Yes, right now. Oh. Should we all run outside? Oh, I know. <laughs> do you really? Do you want to? So yeah. I, I would certainly not have Can you pause the recording for a minute? thought we would get lower prices. Um, we thought we would have the ability um, to have a curbside compost pickup, mm -hmm. which would divert mm -hmm. the food scraps and all the compostable materials out of the trash, making the trash uh, a, a lot, significantly less. less. Um, well, but let me ask. You know, we hear the noises from the college town and all of this. Who is sorting the compost and all of that? They don't, you don't well, have to. Oh. Um, you don't have to separate the compost and the trash? Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, I'll, no she's I talking about residents. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right now we're starting out with residents. So gotcha. they would okay. just have a, instead of having two carts, they yeah, would have either three, three or four carts, gotcha. depending on whether okay. it's dual stream recycling. Um, so the other thing that we could control is, uh, is enforcing pay as you throw. Uh, USA right now has a very, very, very weak pay as you throw system. They have different sized carts, um, and at least in Amherst, our our prices are very different from yours. But they charge a two dollar difference between the. 
32-gallon cart and the 65-gallon cart. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the 65 gallon cart and the 95 gallon cart. Mm -hmm. So, and they don't they don't penalize you if you put it out every two weeks. I mean, they do penalize you if you do. They they don't charge you any more if you put it out every week than if right. you put it out every right. two yeah. weeks. So right. there's no incentive for so, reducing right. your trash right. 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 at all. Right. So there's a lot of problems in their pay as you throw mm -hmm. system. So we thought. If we have a contract, um, we would be able to put those things into the contract and we could put it out in an RFP and, and get the haulers competing with each other to give us a better proposal. So um, uh, that, for various reasons, didn't, wasn't moving for a couple of years, um, but this year we have a combination of counselors on this subcommittee that all want it. Mm -hmm. And so they, they actually pushed hard to get the, uh, get a, get a formal motion of the town council, which voted unanimously to advise the manager to put out an RFP. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge boost. And that, that's what they're in the process of doing now is coming up with what is gonna go into that RFP. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and so, in addition, the program w is set up to, right now, it hasn't been completely fleshed out yet. We don't have a bylaw yet. Um, but we, we propose that it start with one to four family houses that use carts. And then after three years, phase into uh, apartment complexes, condo complexes, so would and you businesses. continue using the carts, or do you want to switch over to the pay as you throw bags? Um, I, uh, that's, that's a discussion that's going to be happening. It's clear that the bag system is the best at reducing waste. Um, the cart system is what the haulers will really be pushing for. Because <laughs> they, they don't need a right. garbage man to do it, really. Yes, right. they don't need to check. And, you know, enforcement of the bag system means they have to open the cart to look inside. Um, so there are different hybrid systems. That's something that they'll be looking at be before putting out the RFP. And they may put out a, an RFP that offers alternatives. You know, like, can you do this? Can you do this? Uh, can you combine these two things? Um, and so they'll be asking the haulers that. So you've started to share some of the unknowns. Um, but I'm just wondering what other things have come up. What, like I saw Guilford, Guilford Mooring's comments in the Gazette in the article related to this. Um, I'm just wondering what are some of the questions you're trying to get answered right now? about where to go next with the system? Well, the, the, we need to know, through the RFP, we'll be getting answers to how much it will cost. That's the biggest question right now. We know that it will cost less without the curbside compost pickup. Um, so we need to f find out what they can offer um, we may be opening it up to multiple haulers. So like there yeah. might be a compost pickup company that wants to do it separately. Like mm -hmm. in Eastern Mass, there's Black Earth Compost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do many towns. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of them are on a voluntary basis. The only one that has started a um, mandatory. more mandatory program is Lexington. They just started a pilot program. Um, it's mandatory, but it's free because they're paying for the pilot program through the ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a beginning, and it's getting people thinking along those lines. So they started with two thousand, and then they this year they have are twenty five hundred, and now they have five thousand people participating in the pilot program, which is what we would be starting with. Um, Amherst is not offering any. ARPA funds, so, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're going to, it, it, it is supposed to be self-funding. 
Um, so yeah, there are, there are a lot of questions about how it would work. The main questions that are coming up are, what would this mean to the transfer station, which we already have? Yeah. Um, and how much will it cost? And why should I do this? I'm already composting in my well, backyard. What would it be to the <laughs> transfer station? Like how, right now, how is the transfer station involved in curbside pickup of trash? Well, right now, um, residents have the option of either uh, doing, a, you know, a contracting with a hauler, or, or a, a take your own. Yeah, yeah. So it's a difference between five hundred fifty dollars a year and $125 a year, $125 a year to get a uh, transfer sticker, station yeah. sticker plus the bags that they will be using. So they sell just 30 gallon ba bags. We would like to be able to, if we do a bag program, do what South Hadley did, which is have, have 13 gallon bags and 30 gallon bags, or even some communities now are doing eight gallon bags. Yeah. So you would just fill the bag in your kitchen and put it in your car. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to have a big bag in your car. You can just put mm -hmm. continually put small bags in. Um, so that would, you know, we hear from a lot of people. We have a lot of little old ladies like me who live alone in a house, and we're paying the same yeah. as um, the family. you know six people family or whatever that are that are putting out two uh you know a 95 gallon container every week yeah mm -hmm. i'm putting out 32 gallon every two weeks <laughs> and i'm paying the same and i don't even fill that up <laughs> so. we just got notice in south hadley that um they're switching from the bags to the containers yeah i right. saw that and what's the advantage well, to the bags versus the containers well the the haulers are driving this by being automated the hauler is saying you need to use the carts because the automated trucks have the arms right 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 they come out and yep. efficiency um overhead so um but some of us have the view that they can use automated and still use bags that there you can still have yep. bags that you're putting in to the carts um, and you can still do dual stream mm -hmm. because you can, you know, forever we would do paper one week and mixed containers the opposite week. <coughs> so you could do that with automated. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities. You know, we don't necessarily, you know, we can, we can try out something new. But there are plenty of communities that have tried different things, bags, bags with stickers mm -hmm. and carts, mm -hmm. and some for hybrid. So, you know, long term, this is going to be an issue for our town. I mean, we used to all just go to the dump. That was the old way. Now, I don't know, Kathy, if there's any, if you have any strong statistics or any concrete statistics of half the people in Hadley go to the transfer station, about half the fourth. people. About it. Mm. About a fourth of the household. That's all. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of people with private haulers, and it really adds up fast. For years, they held the price constant, but over the last three or four years, it's really jumped up dramatically. Well, he's having to recycle. You know, the state is asking people to recycle more and more things, and just he has to haul that stuff, haul mattresses, and he's got to make enough money to I stay heard there's in the business. A a uh, recycling place that takes styrofoam down in Agawam, I just yes. learned about. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is. Yeah, Amherst mm -hmm. stopped recycling styrofoam because yeah. of the cost, mm -hmm. but we would like it to start up again. Um, yeah. So this would be interesting, you know, in the same way that you tied in with a couple of other communities around electrical aggregation. I just wonder if long term once this is rolling for your community, if we could you would say, hmm, you know, maybe Hadley. I don't know. Yes, as I as I mentioned to you, we'd like to do a lot of things with Hadley. Um, we love your farmland and your big box stores with big roofs on them and big parking lots. Yeah. 
<laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, you know, the more help we can get getting solar on those parking lots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the yeah, yeah no, yeah. that would, uh, you know, that would be excellent because we're really trying to focus away from forests and <coughs> on to parking lots and rooftops. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. Um, and, you know, the, the solutions for waste really should be regional. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're pushing for this and we hope we get it, but obviously a regional solution makes a whole lot more sense. Well, that's what Franklin County is very, or their whole waste management system is very organized on the county level. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Not necessarily green, though. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily, I mean, they're, they're organizing administratively to use the same hauler. Is that correct? I don't, I, don't know. I don't know. I just know about their transfer stations, that they're all collecting compost. It's just super organized. Right. Um, it's, it's difficult with smaller towns. Yeah. In, yeah. in far fewer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too. Well, yeah, and it's hard because a lot of the reason that certain residents don't use the transfer station is because they're old, they're disabled, um, or they're so busy <coughs> with a family that they can't, they just don't have the time to do the organizing necessary to take everything over to the transfer station. As far as the, um, the older people and the disabled people and people who who can't uh, get their get their weight their trash down to the road because either their driveway is too long or they're just too old and frail, they have to pay um, oh. USA for what they call boutique services, mm. which is a thousand dollars a year. Wow! To come up the driveway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was that was confirmed to us by by USA when we surveyed them uh, around their costs um, uh, because they weren't on the website. We we surveyed residents to ask them how much they were paying for what, and then once we gathered all the information, we went back to USA and said, "This is what we gathered. Is is this? Can you are, confirm yeah, this? can you confirm yeah. it?" Mm -hmm. And they did. They, yeah. they did, and they talked about the, the boutique services. They said about 200 wow. households were doing the boutique services. That's, That's stunning it. to hear. At the high schooler next door. Can I get down the driveway? Well, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not everybody can afford that. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I, I can understand where if you have a mansion that has a long driveway leading up to it, maybe, that has trees preventing yeah. a truck or... But um, you know there are, there are just houses that are you know on Southeast Street that are I know of one that's a ranch style house. It's just it's just so elevated mm -hmm. that it's hard for the residents to get the get the cart down to the mm -hmm. road, sure. and they have to pay a thousand dollars a year. So um, versus like five hundred basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, it's twice as hard for the hauler to yeah. go get that than to just drive along the road and put yeah. stuff in. Right, right. They need two people instead of one. Yeah. So the whole idea behind this is to, it sounds like dual purpose, reduce the cost to residents and reduce the amount of waste by in s in smaller containers to instead of that would make their monthly or yearly cost less. Right. Well, most people, I, you know, we, Zero Waste Amherst figures that, say you were a person who currently uses a 95 gallon cart. Once you start uh, diverting the food waste from the cart, you won't, you won't necessarily need a 95 right. gallon cart. I mean, that could be so almost as much as half. Right. And some people, as much as 45% of their waste is right. Right. food scraps. And if you eat a lot of takeout, it's a lot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a lot of compostable stuff. You may not need his regular service if your trash isn't spoiling. That's right. right. Exactly. Absolutely. So and and uh, and your your trash all of a sudden is not smelly anymore. Mm -hmm. You can keep it in your kitchen mm -hmm. for a month because there's no food in it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I do that all the time. <laughs> Can I ask a question about home composters? Because we're, we're teaching people a lot of our, some of our outreach requests come in and they're about home composting systems and stuff like that. So, um, and you know, we serve, because we're located in Hadley, we tend to serve a lot of Amherst and Hadley. So I'm curious about, um, is there any kind of um, reduction in fees on the table for people who have home composting systems? I'm not talking about containers, I'm talking about, you know, kitchen scraps and things like that. Is there anything like for people who are Dif you know they're diverting some of it to their to their three bay system or whatever in their backyard. Is, have your has your group talked about that at all? We have not, um, and that's partly because the we think that it will be valuable for people to be able to compost all those other compostable oh, yeah. materials. Also, we don't have data on this, but. Actually, I think the original committee that surveyed the town in 2017 does have information on it. But the number of backyard composters mm -hmm. who actually aerate oh, sure. and turn the that's compost the work. <laughs> that's the work of it. <laughs> is pretty low. Pretty small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most people have a compost pile and mm -hmm. they add to it. Yeah. But unless, and that is very very valuable in that it diverts all that material from a landfill right but it's not that valuable in reducing methane right right, right. it's still making methane unless you turn it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so but it's still and also you can't all the new compostable Take out where you know, and you're yeah. probably not going to put that. Right in no, it doesn't get yeah. hot you can't do enough. It at home. So you, you have to still use. So you end up throwing all that right. stuff in your trash. Right. And you so there's so much advantage to. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot, especially up. in Amherst, the college town yeah. thing of you know a lot of compostable materials. Um, yeah, and most people don't put the meat and the eggs and no. that kind of right. thing in their backyard. That's right. Or even bread, you know. Um, so it, it is a hard sell, though, mm. because people really like their compost piles. <laughs> well, so would you make curbside pickup of compostables mandatory? Or if somebody was doing backyard, point. I know us, uh, I don't know what town it is. Hamilton. Hamilton. There, if you're doing backyard, you can get a sticker that excuses you from curbside. At ha in Hamilton? I, it's someplace. I don't in know. In Massachusetts? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, that, that could be. And, th you know, that's not an impossibility. It just wouldn't encourage people to compost those other things that sometimes are half of the compost. But right. probably college students aren't going to be interested in backyard composting anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, their landlords pay their trash. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's a whole other issue once we get to apartment complexes um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that will be hard to mandate and it may just be making the compost bins available because a lot of people in our apartment complexes and condo complexes have really expressed that they want to be doing this and why are we doing them second, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Couldn't you do it so that they had their little kitchen collection bins and then instead of the carts, you would just have a dumpster out there. You could, you could. Um, yeah, uh, I don't. Yeah. I yeah, don't. it sounds like there's still quite a bit. I think I think it'll have to be when it yeah. comes around time yeah. to do yeah. it. There's I think definitely a way to work it out. Yeah. yeah, I think it'll have to be picked up frequently uh, for apartment right. complexes, um, and. Well, I know, like, um, at our transfer station, we're collecting compost now, and it goes into, you know, one of those metal dumpsters, mm -hmm. and Casella picks it up once a week. Yeah. And it's fine. I mm -hmm. mean, it gets fruit flies in there and stuff, but... I know you've looked at probably lots of examples of places that are doing this well. I was just thinking, when I, I, uh, I worked at a, a public history museum, a rather large one, 
for um, several years while I was in grad school, and they had a really developed um, multi-tiered composting and recycling facility as part of their institution. Mm -hmm. They had a whole section of a block dedicated to it, and I wonder if places like Disney World or Disneyland or something like that has some kind of structure that can UMass be looked at. UMass used to have. Yeah, yeah big UMass. universities and they, urban centers. Things they don't like have the wonder. recycling center anymore? If those might be interesting They're using consider. Martin's farm now. Oh. Um, but yes, well, another reason for Hadley to be doing this mm -hmm. is that ideal for, a, a, for having your own industrial scale compost mm -hmm. facility. Um, yeah. yeah, and there has there, not been much interest mm -hmm. in that. Well, it's complicated it's to do it right. Oh, yeah. No, it it's definitely really complicated. is. complicated. Yeah. M Martin, uh, Adam Martin will yeah. attest to that. <laughs> Are they interested in consulting with municipalities that might want to do that? Are they interested Martin's in Farm? Yeah, I think Martin's Farm is interested in staying in business. I'm sure, but I mean, they can't yeah. do all of Western Mass. I think so that I'm they do now. I mean, are but I mean, if all the municipalities yeah. were were interested in participating, they would reach mm -hmm. capacity oh, on their they, landscape at some oh, point. Oh, they would so. soon. They would yeah. reach it soon. That's a little bit of my worry. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious about their willingness to consult with other groups to get it set up. So I think what would be interesting is if Smith Vogue would start a right. composting program right. that was open to, you know, mm -hmm. that the public could, or that haulers could use. Yeah, yeah. Then they could teach it. Yeah. I wonder if they have the space. They, one. they did, it, but no more. Huh? Do you know why? Yeah, they're tricky. Yeah, I mean, you don't. You want a business to do this. You don't want a school or a municipality. You right. Want to, you want somebody who's going to you know, get out there and start the tractor when it's cold. Mm -hmm. Well, because does it take a break in the summer? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adam <laughs> Martin. Oh my I mean, God. He is watching that thing like yeah, a hawk. Yeah, he is yeah. amazing. Um, so uh, I. I would think that a visit to Martin's farm and a you know an individual tour with him would get whoever is interested give them a good start. Uh, he also has videos that on his website that explain a lot. But obviously, it's there's more to it if you're yeah. actually it's talking about. It's starting. an absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm place and how they structure it and it's not just because there were bald eagles on the edge sort of <laughs> no. waiting for some of the tastier no, Jack and I were saying, <laughs> yeah. to us this is like Disney World it's yes. really it's really cool he's yeah. got this giant sorter and yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. like there's there's a, have you ever heard of bright feeds in Connecticut have you, did they approach to your you guys at all or no no right because they are a um a new company that takes food waste mm -hmm. and they convert it into animal feed. Which what? Is much better than composting. What is it called? Uh, Bright echo feeds? Ecological point. Now using uh, Korean technology, the mm -hmm. Koreans are way ahead on a lot of <coughs> food recycling and um, have been. And they're using artificial intelligence to figure out like, you know, the moisture and the, the feed value of it and uh, I know about it because they approached us at, at the tortilla, tortilleria to take some of our waste and we didn't produce mm -hmm. enough for them at the time. But they use USA as their main hauler and it seems like that would be a better place for UMass to be putting a lot of its food waste than yeah. composting. So they take food waste and turn it into animal. Yeah. What's it called? Bright feeds. Bright feeds. Yeah, feeds. I've got their website up right here, and it leading says, the future oh, of zero waste. waste. Yeah, yeah. Field leading trip. the future of zero waste food recycling, and it says if food waste were a country, it'd be the third largest CO two emitting country in the world. So yeah. they're with you. <laughs> yeah, and so does is the process that it, it it's a much more rapid process. So it's still in the state of. I imagine they're like mixing, you know, different types of, of food waste to get mm. something and dehydrating it somehow. Oh, so it way. isn't like an maybe aeration process. Grinding it's it up breaking or it down, like a co compost breaks it down. Right. This is actually preserving it probably through a cooking and or drying, mm. primarily drying process, so it can mm. turn into a shelf-stable food, food and then feed it and go to chickens or pigs or whatever. Yeah. So they must have 
like a way of refrigerating it or something so it doesn't I doubt it. I or they're, they're, oh, they're drying drying, drying, drying. Yeah. it's yeah. fascinating yeah 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 no it is and from it, an ecological point of view it's way better than composting okay. faster because of the energy taken to compost um, because you're displacing food production which is very energy intensive and land. You're feeding animals waste instead of having to grow stuff. Or right. viable waste. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, one advantage of the composting is that we can include those other compostable materials. Right. Yeah. Which probably aren't yeah. very This is just food, food waste specifically, right? Yeah. yeah. This is probably a great place, like for nice restaurants yeah. that have a lot of you need a lot, or like and, you said, and, college campuses. You need a lot of people yeah. participating in it. So USA can have a truck that comes all the way up here, goes all the way mm -hmm. down there. Which is the problem mm -hmm. with composting in Franklin County for Hadley. It's like yeah. crazy to be driving well, stuff all over the place without. And all. doesn't UMass also bring some of their food waste to uh, Barstow's? The anaerobic digester? Anaerobic digester. No? Okay. <coughs> I thought Barstow's maybe they did. Barstow's doesn't want all that plastic okay. silverware and stuff. Yeah, Barstow's wants a pretty consistent okay. stock. And, and one of the things that Bright Feeds does is they take the silverware, the plastic, and they have winnowers and shredders, and they, they get that right it all, out. and they, <laughs> they have like a lot of tech to do that. Have I you been down there? I haven't been yet. I want to go. I, let, yeah. I want to go. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Field yeah, trip. that is interesting. Yeah. So, Darcy, Megan, thank you for joining yeah. us. Thank you. This is fascinating. So, yeah. I would, I, st I'm definitely following you to see how this goes. And um, I'm yeah. so glad you're doing yeah. it. It's difficult yeah. for those kids. It's fun, sure. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But someone's coming. Okay. So, if yes. you don't have more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this this is great. Totally thank, you. thank you. Yeah. You can no. stay and listen, or, or you can yeah. have, have a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you All right. so much. Thank for you. Having. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Olivia, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Tell everyone. us about Hi. yourself and what thank brings me. you to the table. And Michael, if you want to join the table. Here, I'll scoot over. <laughs> wheel around. Um, so I go to Amherst, which is, thank you so much for your presentation. Oh. I didn't even know so much of that. Um, I'm a poli sci and environmental studies major. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of in the fun spot in the fun age of figuring out what I want to do with my life. So <laughs> how far along are you in your program? Um, I'm a junior right now. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, exploring a lot of options. Um, I really do love like local nonprofit work. I've volunteered like since I was 12. Um, and I actually transferred to Amherst expecting to be an econ major. Um, and then it just didn't work out. And like I grew up on a horse farm. I, you know, spent in some time. What area? Where did you grow up? Military family. So I moved around a lot. So like I lived in Hawaii for a little bit, mm -hmm. um, which I loved, and then when I got older I learned about how horrible the history was and everything that's going on with tourism there, and I said, yeah, I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I lived in Maryland for a good bit, and we had horses, so like I was just outside all the time doing sports, riding, um, and I just slowly like exploring the programs at Amherst, I was just kind of like... Amherst, they take a very direct approach when it comes to like encouraging their students to become change makers and to contribute to the society. And no matter what you're learning about, whether it's issues in policy, issues in human rights, I mean, environment always ties into that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, when you sure. address inequalities, yeah. you can address environmental issues and vice versa. Um, so yeah, it was just one of those things to where the more I learned, I was so upset because I was like, these are such easy fixes. Mm -hmm. You know, composting, recycling, renewable yeah. energy. Yeah. And I just really started like not liking capitalism, which was funny because I started out as a business major and wanted to be like a CEO. Um, and now I'm just like learning more of the truths of the world every day. And just, it's one of those things to where I'm, I was never one of those people to where like I can sit back and do nothing. It's like whatever I can do, I'm gonna do. Um, 
Well, the thing is, you could still be like financially successful and green. yeah, that's another thing. Like I, you know? it was it was definitely a feel that I would always like kind of think about when I was a kid. But like it's there are like a lot of um, skepticisms that you know there's not a lot of jobs in the environmental field or they don't pay well. Um, but it's actually a field that you can tie in with a lot of other fields, whether it's law, policy, you know, even English. You know, you can be a good research writer and mm -hmm. novel writer in environmental topics. And even right now I'm taking a class about environmental sociology, which is like starting to become really popular. Like that's the new buzz. It's really interesting. Um, so yeah, I reached out. Um, you guys, I actually reached out to Amherst. They didn't answer. So I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Hadley is now my new favorite town. Um, and I was just like, I really wanted to get involved with a local community, a local committee, um, and just kind of start from the ground up. Cool. All right. Well, so. welcome. We're, and we're this glad is, to have you. This is Avery from Hampshire. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Love so. and fun. <laughs> so are these going to be two new committee members? How no, they can't going? be committee members, but they can be committee helpers. Committee helpers. <laughs> I like that. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and we intend to... I'm going to put that in the that minutes. They do a, a big helpful thing. That's an interesting title, committee helpers. Well, I love that's it. a good it's one. Kind yeah. of a babyish way of saying it, but mm -hmm. I guess consultants or yeah. interns or I don't know. Helpers, well, welcome interns. and welcome to you both. It's really good to have other ideas and just mm -hmm. widen our minds. So, do we want to talk to them about? Um, well, let's let's move on. We have a lot to do, okay. and it's already almost right. ten past eight. Maybe next time. So, Michael, I'm just wondering about solar with either the senior center or solar on the landfill, or what's up with solar? Yeah, I spoke with um, uh, Jane, and the senior center is the contract is set, and they're yeah. thinking maybe January start for the installation. Wait, 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 wait. Good. Oh. Yes. Okay. Valley Solar. Valley Solar okay. won the won the bid and um, So they they have the plan? Yeah, that's you're thinking about the, the landfill which it requires more no, 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 no Valley about. Solar if they're going to do the bid they have to have a plan. Yeah. Okay. Plan. They, oh yeah, okay. No, so they've yeah. been here and they've evaluated the, the site more carefully and they're ready to, they're getting ready to go. It's about 85 megawatt system, uh, 85 kilowatt system, yeah. so pretty good size. And it takes some time um, to get the permits and application process. I guess that's the biggest slow. I mean, that's why it's not starting tomorrow. But oh, okay. But it's it's moving along well, and uh, James seems very happy with it. Um, well, at least you have moving. a target month. I mean, um, and um, so that's this building. The landfill um, in July select board meeting um, it was approved that the town would allocate $12,500 I believe, quote me on the exact amount, somewhere in the 12, uh, to begin a preliminary applica application process with Eversource and to do that with um, um, Solar Design Associates, who could who, who could provide that service to the town, and um, <coughs> it sort of got derailed by the 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 town administrator just being didn't get around didn't get around to it, and, and she has since uh, resi resigned for health reasons, and the new chief of police, Mike Mason, is the acting administrator, as we know, and he was has. We've, he's been brought in and brought up to speed on the project and has committed to figure out how to find that money that's okay. been, that's mm -hmm. been approved. So yeah. that's moving along. So that's how amazing. Much, yeah. How much money did the town approve? Uh, $12,500 or thereabouts. So Whatever it's going to cost. In the 12th. And it's only going to cost about half of that to do the um, application process to hire the consultant to do the application process is going to cost the other half, I believe, maybe an application fee to every source. And okay. So, um, that's great progress. So that's moving along. I, th I thought it was just in, in going to be in the doldrums because of the uh, town administrator situation, but uh, this 
God bless our police chief, man. Right, that's what I'm hearing. That <laughs> he is really uh, making things happen. And this is the police chief? He's yep. the acting, who is the acting town oh, administrator. Okay, Got and it. He's just incredibly competent and uh, doing a great All job. Right. Hmm? Awesome. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, and Green Communities, Kathy? Well, let me just check. I emailed um, Chris. Oh, okay, here we go. Yep. So I emailed him about getting the, the new quotes. Should I backtrack a little bit here? No. Okay. I feel like I should. We got quotes on weather stripping doors and window repairs at the two schools. Um, and then when we had this joint meeting with Chris Mason, Gary Berg, Chris Desjardins, myself, and Mimi, just to talk about all this other um, information that we need to provide to get all our stuff together to send off to green communities for them to okay us spending money on these projects. Uh, Gary Berg mentioned that he thought we could do a lot better if Chris Desjardins instead of uh, Lazote and who else did he, uh, AMP I think is who he got um, quotes from for the work. Gary suggested that he get in touch with um, Greenfield Glass and another company called NSA. So I emailed Chris to see if he, you know, how that was going. Here's what he says. Greenfield wanted to tie in visiting the schools with a project near here that they have. NSA said they would get back to me once they had a date and time they could come take a look. As has been typical with these items, no one seems chomping at the bit to come and give a quote. I'll reach out to them again, as I haven't heard back from either of them since we first spoke. And that's the school business manager. Okay. So th uh, that first set of quotes it took months to get those. So maybe we're looking yeah. at doing that again, but I guess we should. <coughs> yeah. It's due diligence. If it's going to save the town money, then I guess maybe we should do it. But anyway. So that's what's going on with that. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Uh -huh. So flood insurance, Hurricane Helene and Hadley, I mean, that could be a topic for another meeting. But it's really interesting. A lot of people who dealt with that first hurricane remember that hurricane swept up and took the turn toward Asheville, mm -hmm. North Carolina, mm -hmm. and they just wouldn't even consider having flood insurance because they're up in the mountains hundreds of miles from the coast. Mm -hmm. So, so many of those properties don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's a real concern. Now, Hadley has a, a real big slice of town that's next to the river. So, you know, I think as we keep working with this committee, that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. Like, do people who need that have, have flood insurance. Do you have flood insurance? No. Do you have flood insurance? Have you ever flooded? No. We're a little bit higher. We're sort of on the edge of Indian Hill. I've got my plan in my mind to like move the furnace upstairs in the basement. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Well, have, it's a big deal because flood, flood insurance mm -hmm. is pretty expensive, isn't it? Well, a lot of rain recently. Yeah, well, it's stunning because there were parts of Florida where they were paying about $1,000 a month for flood insurance. Mm -hmm. Understand, Florida, I think its highest point is something like 300 feet. Right. I mean, yeah. Florida is not a high state. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a real concern. So, Avery, are you from Florida? Yep. So, from the mountains of Florida? <laughs> Where? There's no mountains. What part of Florida? Where the um. hill? <laughs> Yeah, I'm from Sarasota. Oh, wow. in, okay. It's about an hour south of Tampa. Like, mm -hmm. actually, wasn't that like the th point? They've where the been hurricane like hit, hit every yeah, storm. The, the eye rest. of the hurricane went over my house. Mm -hmm. Wow. Are you, but are you, thank God it wasn't nearly okay? as bad as they thought it might be. Right. Mm -hmm. Your yeah. house still sitting there? Yep. Um, yeah, my my family is um if if fine. I'm very grateful that. Like my grandpa's house didn't flood because, um, well, yeah, that was just it, it kind of a, it kind of a danger. He was in the flood zone. Well, right after looking at the pictures of what happened around Ashfield, 
I mean, Asheville. Where, I mean, yeah. houses just washed away. And I yeah. kept picturing that happening, like, in your neck of the woods, but it didn't. Yeah, Fort, Fort Myers must be so sad right now. Oh, really? Did they, Fort Myers get hit really bad? Mm-hmm. Mm. It's usually the right side of the hurricane that the meteorologists would call the dirty side, and that's where the most more intense wind and rain and everything else. Mm -hmm. But you know, Tropicana Field, the home of the Mm -hmm. Tampa Rays, Mm -hmm. the roof roof. was completely ripped off. That was stunning to see them flying over. Wow. So, look, Hadley's been really lucky. 1936, 1938, those were terrible hurricanes. So many of the barns went down, so many trees went down. Uh, eventually, though, I think Hadley's going to get caught again, yeah. like so many of these other places. Yeah. So that's yeah. just something to talk about at another meeting. Okay. <coughs> so let's move on to 6.1 report on hazardous waste data. Did you hear any more? I did. Um, he emailed me back, and 19. 19- People from Hadley showed up, which is that's the highest number yet. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. Nice. I, I, and then I emailed them back. It's like, and how many total? I was interested in how many total. I think year before last, it was almost about 300. Yeah. So it's mostly Amherst residents, but mm-hmm. it's nice when Hadley folks show up. It is for sure. Um, I'm going to hold on the climate bill, 6.3, because (coughs) there's not a lot of news. But for 6.2, Avery, Olivia, everybody in this committee, investigating climate action plans. You know, have these so small, we don't have a planner. Right now we don't have an administrator. Well, we have an interim administrator. We don't have a sustainability officer. Right. But yet, we're wondering if there are some ways that we can move forward with climate action plans, like modeled off of East Hampton. They're working well, on there. what I'm thinking is the three main towns we've looked at is Amherst, Northampton, and East Hampton. In my opinion, Northampton has the most readable. It, it's very well done. But it's more than just climate action. It's climate action and mitigation their hazard mitigation plan. All, I mean, that's what the state is wanting, for it to be all of it. What we were wondering is how you two would like to look at those three plans and maybe look at Worcester's plan also, or any other, if you can if you can find a small town in, in Massachusetts that's got a climate action plan. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find one. Um, and do a basic outline for us. like. What is in not necessarily the minutia of what they're doing in their town, but just like an outline of what steps would we need to take in Hadley to develop an, a climate action plan, like focus groups and outreach and hiring consultants and finding funding for hiring consultants and, you know, just you know, a, like a reporter, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I believe you two have been connected. There was one email that both of you received from me um, um, that I think you have each other's emails. I don't Just look at it. It's in, in the last yes. week okay. you would have gotten it. it. It's a start. It's a thought. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, you I know, mean, if I, you guys want to help, yeah. we could really use the help. With that, oh. That's one thing that would really Absolutely. make a difference. <clears throat> and you both have some experience with. Mm-hmm. Um, I said Avery J. A little bit, yeah. Avery J. Avery J. Is it Northam? Oh, that must be someone. It's not protonmail.com. Oh. That must be a different Avery. She's looking for your email address. No, I think Olivia and Avery were included on an email oh, okay. from me and Kathy. Oh, okay. No, so that to me. No, yeah. I wasn't part of that. Got it. Um, got, got yeah, it. I know the email was forwarded to me. Like, I had your email. I can reach out. Okay, okay yeah. Send me an email. and make sure I have it. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Okay. All right. It is 
A20. There is no one from the public here for comment. You don't want to talk? The only sure. comment I'll make is just in this. I know UMass has been working on a climate resiliency plan, and it's very different. You know, obviously, of course, because it's being, a school. Yeah. You know, a thirty-three thousand dollar, thirty-three thousand person, yeah. not including staff and faculty, but it's just another place that to is look doing at that. And at the colleges as well, it might be interesting to see um, how resourced that is, how they're doing it. I mean, they have a, you know, the, the money there is tremendous at Amherst and Smith uh, to do what they're doing with the geothermal and just otherwise. So just to see what kind of resources they've tapped into um, and whether any of that is, is shareable in any way. Yeah, thanks for that idea. And, you know, one comment I'll make, and I've reached out to some members of the school committee or a member of the Hadley School Committee because they have been doing some test drilling for geothermal mm -hmm. to power the high school. Mm -hmm. The high school's original heating system is steam. Yeah, it needs to be uh, you know from 1964 wow. or something like that mm -hmm. so they're really looking at making some progress and going with a geothermal system mm -hmm. which would be incredible and the folks from both I think Amherst College and from Smith have been helping them mm -hmm. offering yeah, some Amherst ideas. Amherst is switching to geothermal and, and I know Mount Holyoke at the end of the last spring they did a big construction site because they were building geothermal mm -hmm. piping. Smith is doing that too. Yes, right. yeah. I, that's what I thought of Smith was too. <laughs> and UMass, I think, too, right? Pretty sure. So thanks again. And it's, it's important sometimes to come to these meetings just to hear everything that is going on. Um, another For another meeting, we hope with the other committee members, we hope to do some brainstorming. We expect that Catalina will be back mm -hmm. um, next month and have her voice added to that. And just other ideas to investigate for our committee. Yeah, if you guys have. So just kind of keep your um, ears open. Other things we should be. It's great to have you know, Darcy, who's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like <coughs> down the road, but We'd be foolish not to look into doing that. It'd save people so much money. Well, that's the cool. Well, the transfer station saves people a whole lot. No, no, no. But not everybody is interested in hauling their own trash. You know. No. Or able to, like Darcy really pointed out. That was uh, that was an important point. But to when mention. you could, when the it, when the town contracts with one hauler, then you have all kinds of you have control, and you can bring costs down, but also incentivize people to reduce their solid waste by separating it. Yeah, well we're so lucky because we have like unlimited compost pile in <laughs> my house. It's great. We, you know, we never throw out any food waste because right. we just put it on the compost pile and we see what animals come and eat it. Right. And it right. actually, right. it works really right. well. Some of it can go to your garden. That's what happens with mine. Mine has a hole in the side of it and all kind of critters get up. but I don't really care. You yeah. know, yeah. it's yeah. like mine ends up in the garden in the springtime, mm -hmm. and it works. It really works well. All right. Um, so I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting at eight twenty-five. Okay. Is there a second? Yep. I second it. All right. And yep. vote. Yep. All in favor. Okay. Thanks. Okay.